And now we're going to be turning to Scripture. We're going to be sharing with you something from the book of Mark. Mark chapter 14. Uh, we're going to be reading the prayer of Jesus at Gethsemane. We're going to be, Mark, of course, is one of the Gospels. You've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John at the beginning of the New Testament. You can follow along with your own Bible or your electronic Bible, if your digital Bible, if you've got one. And we're going to start at four, chapter 14, verse 32. They, that is the disciples and Jesus, went to a place called Gethsemane. It's a garden, by the way. And Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here, keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and he found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. And of course, he would go on after the arrest to deny his Lord three times. Once more he went away and prayed the same thing, and when he came back, he again found them sleeping, because their eyes were heavy, they did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Enough, the hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Father God, I pray that you will speak to us by your Holy Spirit what you've put on my heart for this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, the two times that uh, Pastor Trevor preached earlier in February, he preached on the topic of prayer. We discussed it. It was something that was on my heart. It was on his heart. He preached on that. And his focus was on the Lord's Prayer. That's what we call the prayer where the disciples ask Jesus, teach us how to pray. And that's the prayer that he then taught them. But Jesus also prayed much himself, and some of his prayers and pieces of his prayers are recorded for us in Scripture. One of them is in this place, the Garden of Gethsemane. Another notable place is also John chapter 17, where Jesus prays for his disciples and also for all the believers who would come after that, after his disciples. And what I want to do this morning is to look at how he prayed in Gethsemane in particular. And so it's not the Lord's Prayer that we've learned, but it is the Lord praying his prayer. And he went to, that, to Gethsemane on the night in which he was betrayed after his last supper with his disciples. Judas had gone off to betray him. Jesus knew what was coming. And he was filled with sorrow, his soul. And he was troubled and he was distressed. He was in agony. And he prayed out of that. And we want to look at that prayer. It's a very short prayer. And we're going to look at it phrase by phrase. There's something in each phrase that we want to look at here. The first is this. He started this way. Abba, Father. Now as you listen to that and listen to him praying that, you realize that what he's doing is the same thing he said to his disciples when he taught them how to pray. He said, you should pray this way, Father. Or in other Gospels, our Father in heaven. And so what he was doing was he was teaching them to pray the way that he prayed. 
And we see him praying. We listen to him here. And we hear him starting with the same way that he taught. Father. That's how he starts John 17, if you check it out. First word of his prayer. Father. Now in this prayer, it's interesting because it's not just Father. It is Abba. Father. Abba is Aramaic and means Father. It's like Papa. It's what a child would call his or her father, Abba. I remember years ago uh, being in a, in a, making a stop at a rest area and uh, a Jewish man, a father coming in with this, this little boy and the little boy saying to, calling him Abba and thinking, ah, yeah, that's it. Jesus would have called his own father Abba. And here he is calling his father in heaven, Abba. It's very close. It's loving. It's intimate. And that's how he wants us to pray. And what we see here is what we've talked about in the other services. The key to prayer is relationship. And it is that relationship. It is a relationship of child to father. It is a relationship of love and of trust and of intimacy between a child and a father. Abba, Father. And I think it's no wonder that Jesus opens this prayer with that closeness and that intimacy because this is his very soul crying out to his father on the night in which he was betrayed. That relationship is the key to prayer. We've said that. It is the key to how we live as believers. We said that too, but it bears saying again. That relationship is the key to who we are in Jesus Christ and belonging then to a Father. John said in chapter 1 that to everyone who received Jesus and believed in Him, He gave the right to be children of God. The right to say then, Abba, Father. Father, my Father. And to live out of that. Christianity is not about rules to follow. Checklists to check off. Things you're supposed to do and not do. Even though there are things like that. It is about relationship with our Heavenly Father. And that changes everything. Jesus prayed, Abba, Father. And then the next phrase is this. Everything is possible for you. Everything is possible for you. So if the key to prayer is, and the key to being a Christian is to be a child to the Father, to know the Father, to grow in that love and to trust Him, then one of the keys to prayer, one of the places to start is with this, with faith. And the faith is everything is possible for you. And you think about it, there are no limits on God. He is the creator. Every single thing that exists in this life, he made. And that means then that it's in his hands and under his control. Even when things seem out of control, and it seemed like the world had spun out of control when sin entered into it and has continued, he's at work in it. Everything is possible for you. That's why Jesus starts his prayer then with his Father, knowing that there is nothing that is impossible for him. He's bigger than everything. There's nothing that he can't do. 
And I'm reminded actually of a story a little bit earlier in the book of Mark where Jesus has come down from the Mount of Transfiguration. His disciples have been trying to cast out an evil spirit from this boy. And uh, he had had an evil spirit that would make him convulse and cast him down on the ground and even into fires. And they weren't able to do it. And the distraught father said to Jesus, if you can do anything, And Jesus' response was, if I can, or rather, if you can, quoting them, anything is possible for those who believe. And he cast out the demon and set him free. Now, we struggle with that because there are things that we think that's too big, that's impossible. God couldn't do that. Everything is possible for God. That's what Jesus prayed. That's what he said. It was true for him, it's true for us. Now here's the interesting thing about that, because it's going to prove that there is something that is not possible. God could do it. But it's not possible because of his will and his plans and his purposes We're going to see that as we walk through this prayer. But what this means is that every petition that we make to him, think of the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. Forgive us our sins, and so on. He can do it. And every petition that we make of him, every ask that we make of him, he can do it. Whether it's a big ask or a little ask, he can do it. And that'll lead us then into the next piece of the prayer, the next phrase. Having prayed, everything is possible for you. He then prays, take this cup from me. And he's talking about what's coming. He knows what is coming. He knows that he is being betrayed. He knows there's a cross that he's going to go to. He knows that. He's been telling them that. But he says to his father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. That is a big ask. It is what is on his heart. It is his very soul because his soul feels at the point of death because of knowing what's coming. And he's crying out, take this cup from me. And so it is that the things that are on our heart, God, our Father, wants us to talk to Him about that, bring them to Him, and even things like that, to say, take this, do this. And He just puts it right out there. It's just like nakedly there. Take this cup from me. Now the thing is, And he would have known this. He must have known this. It wasn't possible. I mean, his father could have taken it from him, but if he had, it would have meant then no salvation. God's will, plans, purposes unfulfilled. Which is why the last phrase is so important. You see, God will not do anything. And we see that here with Jesus because He has plans and He has purposes that He's at work on. And it's a pla- those are places where we have to trust ourselves to Him. The thing that strikes me in this, though, is that Jesus prays this prayer three times. 
Matthew tells us that. Three times he prayed this prayer. And yes, he prayed many other things, but this was the core of it. Three times. Take this cup from me. Can we ask for things? Yes. Can we ask again and again? Yes. But there comes a time when we have to also pray the last phrase that Jesus prayed, and that is, yet, not what I will, but what you will. Now, for us, sometimes we will pray that at the end of a prayer. We've prayed for something big, and we think, God won't do it. God can't do it. I don't want to be disappointed. So we pray, God, but your will be done. And sometimes for us, that's like a weasel phrase. It gets us out of the disappointment that, that we're sure is going to come. Not always, but sometimes. That is not what Jesus was doing here. This is not lack of faith on his part. This is him being in relationship, child to the Father, the Son. Submitting himself then to the Father as a child does, saying, I will trust you with this. Even this incredibly big, passionately felt, deep ask, I will trust you with this. Not my will but your will be done. And when you think about it, what Jesus is praying here is part of what he taught the disciples to pray in the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He's praying the will of the Father be done, that His kingdom come. That's what this is about. That's why He is at this place. That's what the cup is about. If there's any other way, but there isn't. If His Father took the cup away, there would be no salvation for sin. No salvation for us and for this broken world. But it was the Father's will to provide salvation. And this was the only way. And so it was that the Father had sent the Son. And so it was that the Son had come. To do the Father's will. That's what Jesus always did. He said, I do what I see the Father doing. I'm here to do my Father's work. And so here too, He says, not my will, your will. And for us, as we pray and as we live our lives, that is so often the issue, isn't it? Whose will is going to be done? My will? God's will. What's going to be done here? And sometimes it's hard to know, but to trust ourselves then to our Father, Abba, Father, that He has plans and purposes sometimes we don't even know about, and He will work them out. Trust ourselves to Him. Your will be done. Not mine. Now this prayer takes place in a garden in Gethsemane. There was another prayer, there was another garden, rather. At the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis, it's the Garden of Eden. And what happened in that garden? Well, the serpent came to Eve and tempted her, and she looked at that fruit and thought, it looks delicious, it looks like it's good for you, and the promise is that if we eat it, we will not need God. And what she chose and what Adam chose as they ate that fruit was, my will be done. 
not your will. And here in the garden, in this prayer, Jesus is doing a different choice on behalf of humanity. He is fully human as well as fully divine. That's why his soul is so burdened going to the cross. And that's why when he submits himself to the will of the Father, instead of not not his will, he's doing the opposite of what Adam and Eve did in the first place. And when they did that, they said, my will, not yours. Sin entered the world. Death entered the world. Things fell apart. It was not what they expected. And now as he says, not my will be done, but your will be done, salvation can come for you and for me. Now we don't follow the church year very closely here at Maranatha, but there are certain things. We're entering into the season of Lent this coming week. Lent is the time before Easter and Good Friday. Six weeks. And during the time, we look ahead to what is coming. We look ahead to what's going to be happening as Jesus is betrayed here after praying this prayer. We look ahead to what was necessary for our salvation, His death, His sacrifice, the cross, His resurrection. The new life, that's there. And so I think this is also a good place then to be looking at how Jesus himself prayed and how he submitted himself to the Father and walked that out. In the weeks that lie ahead, one of the things that traditionally people do is they give certain things up, they fast. You can do that, that's okay. You, you don't have to either. But one of the things that I would suggest that we do is to take this time to let Jesus, to let the Father, to let the Holy Spirit speak to our hearts. Speak to us about who the Father is and what it means to be His child and to walk like Jesus did then in the kind of trust that runs like a thread through this whole prayer. I know for myself, when my life changed after Willow Creek, that there was a period of time, it was quite a long period of time, where I spent time praying, Father, and just focusing very consciously on Father. Who does God say He is? What is Father like? What does Father mean to me? Are there things that need to be rewritten? What was been my experience of Father? How have I been a father. And what does this mean? And I spent time looking then at Jesus after that to figure out who is the Son and his relationship to the Father. And then spent time with the Holy Spirit to learn who he was because his job is to make all this real and make this alive. I would encourage us as we walk through Lent, focus on Jesus. He shows us the Father. If you have doubts about the Father and whether you can trust Him or whether He's strong enough or whether He cares about you, focus on Jesus and see what He's like and see how His relationship was with the Father because we share the same Father. That's how He taught us to pray. And you might spend time doing that and we might ask God then, show yourself to us that I may know you better. And out of that comes our prayers. Out of that comes our lives and how we live them. At the end of the day, Jesus did what his Father showed him. He said, not my will, but your will be done. And because of that, we can celebrate. We can rejoice. Even though this was an agonizing prayer for Jesus. Stand with me. Let's pray.
Father God. We need to know you as Father. And we need to know what it means to be children. And so we look to the relationship between you and Jesus. And as he says, Abba, Father, we want to learn how to say Abba, Father, too. And know the reality of that in our own lives. I pray that you will make that more real for us through your Holy Spirit. That you will, in this period of time leading up to Good Friday and Easter, show who you are to us and the relationship between you and the Son. And invite us deeper into a relationship that says, Abba, Father. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.